can't see ourselves very well on our knees. We're very weak there, but God is not. He's never weak. God is strong. He wants to meet you this morning at your need. What is it that you need? Maybe it's something in your body. Maybe it's something in your wallet. Maybe it's something in your family. Maybe it's something in your job. Would you lift it up to him? I'd like you to do a little spiritual dance with me. I'd like you to hold your hands in front of you like a cup. Put them together like this. Just make a little cup out of your hands. Hold it up to your, close to your face. And in a moment, here's what you're going to do with that cup. You're going to pour your drink offering into it. The drink offering is going to be your words. And your words are going to embody your need. You're going to say, Jesus, this is what I need. I need money. I need healing. I need righteousness. I need my marriage to be put back together. I need my son and my daughter to come home. Stop doing what they're doing. I need guidance. I need comfort. What is it that you need? Speak it. Pour it like a drink offering into the bowl that is in your hands. And then, after you have done that, you're going to lift your bowl, your drink offering to the Lord. And at some point, you're going to let your hands go apart because you're going to let it go. You're going to give it up to Him. You are
you are so amazing. I love it that you're here. That you're here, and you're here to engage us. You're not absent. You're not aloof. You don't like to be separated from your people. You love to be with us. What an amazing thing. How amazing. We're going to do some more of this, dude. You understand that, right? You're not, you're, you're not going to get rid of me by uh, just because we live on the opposite coasts. This is going to let's make a relationship between our churches. Okay? We, uh, I just became a pastor for the first time in my life, and our church is like your church. We had, uh, it's actually not a church plant, but it may as well be because it shrunk all the way down to nine people. But you know what I discovered? It's easier to change the DNA at nine than it is at 50 or 200, you know? Oh, it's because of all those systems. And uh, I don't believe in those things either. I was talking to a pastor the other day, and he said, you know, he said, why don't we have it? youth programs and children's programs. When, when Sunday school was first invented, a little over a hundred years ago, hundred something years ago, it got a lot of resistance from the church, from the leaders. All the denominations went, Sunday school, why? It's that's why it's coming. Now, it's like, you, you mean you have a church and you don't have a Sunday school? I don't think Paul had Sunday school going to Corinth and Ephesus and Tarsus and going, where's the Sunday school? <laughs> but we get so beholden to the systems of Christianity, and especially in America, because Christianity is our whole religion here. You can be a Christian and never be a Christian, you know, here in America. It's easy. Maybe you're doing it. I don't know. I did. We get so beholden to the way it works, the way we think it's supposed to work, that we uh, we we build this world that's kind of like Disneyland. You know what it is? It's a it's a safe, predictable adventure with a with a a, a, a predictable end. You know how the, this is? This looks like an adventure. Whoa, we're a wild ride. Woohoo! This is dangerous and scary, but I know I'm going to be okay because the ride's going to come to end and I'm going to unbuckle and I'm going to get out and go, wasn't that great? That's what church is like so many times. It's like the Disneyland version of life. We're going to take you on a little ride and it's going to look scary, but hey, don't worry about it. I don't know that Thomas had that assurance when he went to India. I don't know if Jesus told him, you know, I'm sending you to India, and you know, it's gonna feel dangerous, but it's not gonna really be dangerous. Don't worry about it, it's not real. It's just a ride. How about Peter? When they're tacking him up on that cross and hanging him upside down, that's what he requested, because he didn't want to be hung the same way that Jesus was hung. So they turned him upside down, feet up, and that's how he died. What are we wanting? Are we wanting Disneyland version of life? Or do we actually want a life? This 90-year-old guy that came to our church, he's been there from the very beginning, and he just wouldn't leave, he and his 87-year-old wife. They've been there since 1996, man. The first day that the church opened its doors, they were there. And he was there every weekend. We meet on Friday nights. And he was there every weekend until last, just two nights ago, because he died on Wednesday. He passed away, 90 years old. My brother died last two years ago at the age of 49 massive stroke pow boom gone everybody has a last day you never know when it's going to be you know and it's like what did you want out of life you want to be safe and secure you want to have a just a really nice disneyland kind of a life where what sure feels dangerous what an adventure this is no adventure ask the ride operator is this an adventure 
No, it's safe and it's predictable. You know how it's going to end. It only makes news when it doesn't end like it's supposed to end. Right? I don't want that kind of life. I've never wanted it and I don't want it now. I want a real adventure. I don't want to go on Indiana Jones Wild Ride. I want to go to Indonesia. I want to do it myself. I want to go to India. I want to live here in the adventure of not knowing about God and having this system of Christianity around me. This is how we do it. And we lift our hands and we get excited. Just what you were saying. I just appreciated it so much. About, you know, I don't care if you do. we play fast songs and you jump and stuff. Who gives? And who cares, you know? What is the important thing? What are, what are we here for? Are we here to have a little program? No, we're here for the presence of God. He says that there's something about the community. He says that when two or three of you are gathered there, am I in the midst? You know this already. We'll talk about this maybe a little bit. But God is already with you. He's already here. But there's something about more here when two of us get together. There's something about the community. And the community is not about doing a system, fulfilling an order of service. Those things are important. They... they, uh, they Evolved over time because they sort of embody the important aspects of church life and worship. But they become so strictured and structured that it becomes like strapping into the ride. And you just go on the ride and you know where it's going to end. It's predictable. And yet it goes up and down and fast and slow. The worship was so good this morning. I just, I, I really, I don't like it when anybody tells me the worship was so good. So that's like, what's that? It's not for you. Yeah, it's it's like we weren't here for the, the ride of worship. Right. We were here to be with Jesus. Yes. There are a lot of people who love worship like other people love sex. They're they're addicts for worship. Worship is of course spiritual sex. You know that. But they're addicts for this rather than loving the person. That they are engaging. It's Jesus. What do you want out of life? You want to know about it? There are a lot of churches that can give you that. A lot of places. God bless you and have a great time. It's not what I want. I want to be with Him. I want to be with Him. And I want to recognize that I'm with Him. Every moment of every day. going to just talk for a few minutes. I'm not going to sing any more songs. Can I just talk, chat for just a few more minutes? And then, uh, I know you have a time constraint and what we're... I'm going to get you out of here in time. And besides, we want to beat the restaurant, uh, the Baptist to the restaurant, you know, we want to get there because they're real selfish. <laughs> um, let me put this down somewhere. I just want to talk for so, uh, right. You got ten minutes. Yeah, that's that's just plenty. When I uh, at the the church where I am now, it's called the Tree. <laughs> we actually thought, you know what? If we start more churches, which is what we want to do, we, we'd rather have instead of a church of three thousand, we'd rather have ten churches of three hundred. We're going to call it the orchard. <laughs> okay, so real briefly, this is this is what is on my heart most these days. Okay, we ask this question. It's real popular. It's ubiquitous. But before we ask, before I tell you what the question is, you have to know that your language frames your understanding of life how you approach it, how you live it, how you understand what's going on. It frames your relationship with God. For instance, if somebody says, I'm a follower of Christ, the visual, what's a, what's a follower? Come, come here. I'm going to follow you, okay? Okay, so you just, you don't have to move, just stand. We're going to just make a little tableau here. 
This is following, right? Do you see your, your language has made a visual picture of your relationship with God? He's ahead of me. I'm behind him. I'm not with him. I'm following him. He's not looking my direction. We're both looking the same direction and we're going the same direction. This is not necessarily what God called you to. Jesus talked about coming alongside, right? So it was like this. It wasn't even like, uh, you stay over there, I'll stay over here. It was March. It was alongside. So, thanks. You're done. Pick up your check at the office. <laughs> All I'm, I'm saying that only to illustrate how language is important. How you talk about your relationship with God is how you, it shapes and expresses how you think about your relationship with God. So if you're a follower, you're probably not going to engage in very much. You're probably just going to want to know the direction. That's as much as you need. If you're a disciple, then you are probably just going to want to know the rules. You're going to know what he wants, what he expects of you. It's like being a line worker in a factory. Just give me the job list. I'll do the job list. I'll let you know if I need any materials, if I run out of anything but, so I can't do my job. And that becomes our prayer life. Dear God, please do this and do this and do this and this and give us this. It's just like you're just asking for materials to do the work. There's more to it than that. So the phrase that we use is uh, this question we ask. We wear it on our you know, little uh, wristbands and we put it on posters and make songs about it. It's, what would Jesus do? WWJD, I mean, come on. Can you get more American Christian than that? WWJD, what would Jesus do? I think it's a terrible question. I think it's terrible, it's awful, because it frames how you understand your relationship with God in this way. What would Jesus do? Two presumptions in the question that are dangerous and harmful to your relationship with God. The first one is this. The presumption is that Jesus is not here. What would Jesus do were he actually here? So we're thinking of nativity to Calvary and then that crazy day of 40 days of appearances and then the ascension. We're thinking of that as the life of Jesus and then we're all alone after that. And what would Jesus do if he were here? I think that's dangerous because Jesus is here. He's here. You're asking a question. It's as though you were willing to live with his love letters, but you don't want to talk to him. He's right here, and you're saying, I don't want to talk to you. I would rather read what you wrote and read what other people wrote about you than to actually talk to you. The second presumption in the question is this, that I think is dangerous. Jesus is not here. That's the first one. And I, I'm not going into this in depth, but I think you can preach it to yourself later, you know? So the presumption, what would Jesus do? Jesus is not here. And second presumption in the question is this. I must act like Jesus would. Or like I think he would act in this situation. What would Jesus do? Do you know how dangerous that is? What would Jesus do? The choices that you make may not necessarily be what God is intending. You're supposed to make this up on your own. What would Jesus do were he here? I am called upon to do that. You know what this does for you? It adds a layer of pretension to your life. Because now you're no longer being you. You're being you playing the part of Jesus. Well, I'm not a doctor, though I play one on television. Well, I'm not Jesus, but I'm playing the part of Jesus today. What would he do? It also... That, that pretension can so easily slide into hypocrisy. I don't think it's any wonder when we find out that some well-respected man of God has un been uncovered in this 20-year life of sin. It happens all the time, you know. Some guy's doing some wacky stuff over here, and, and people go, how could that happen? I'll tell you, it's easy to do. Because when you're acting like Jesus, you don't ever have to be like Jesus. You just act like him. So everything can rot away underneath and you still got, what would Jesus do? So I think there's a better question. The better question is this, Jesus, what are you doing? 
I want to do it with you. This is too mystical for most people because they just want the book. They just want the Bible. Just give me the Bible. Tell me the rules. Tell me how to live and what to do. And I'll do that. That's easy. It's Disneyland. Just strap me in. Buckle me down. And take me on a ride. And I know how it's going to end. That's not what you were called for. It's not what you were made for. Your, your mind, your body, your soul, your emotions, everything about you was not made to live like that. You were made to live in the presence of God. Lo, I am with you always. Did he mean it? Is he lying? I will never leave you or forsake you. Is it true? I love this. If you had your eyes open this morning, you probably saw me doing this at some point. It's a reminder for me. In Him we live and move and have our being. We're swimming in it all the time. We're swimming in the presence of God. He's here. He's here. He's invited us into this relationship where we can know Him and we can know what He's doing. Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. Greater works than these shall you do. I think that God, we, God has invited us in to the relationship where we can say, what are you doing? And he'll show us. Jesus, what are you doing? Because I want to do it with you. Why not? What would change about your day tomorrow if you, if you woke up and instead of just hopping out of bed and making a coffee, the first thing you did was to raise your hand. Mom does this, and I've taken it up as my habit to raise my hand up, open and empty, and just say, Jesus, what are you doing? What are you doing today? I want to do it with you. See, here's the deal. We're trying to live like Jesus. Can I tell you something? That's way too much work. And it's impossible. You can't do it. You, you don't have the mind big enough to grasp what it is that God has called you to do. You can't merely make the decision that you think is the right decision and do the will of God in circumstances. You can't be like Jesus. I have this friend named Jack Haper. He's a pastor, in, was a pastor in California. And he has a very distinctive way of speaking. He does, he does this kind of move a lot and then he brings his hand back to his chin, but he doesn't always land in it. So he'll go, good morning church, we're just going to worship Jesus this morning. We're going to gather together, so come in and find your places and let's sit down, let's stand up and let's worship. And he's always, and by every tenth time, he'll land that thing on his chin, right? And he gets, and everybody goes, yay, he landed. It's very distinctive, you know, in the way he talks, and he takes, he takes a lot of uh, uh, parenthetical diversions in his, in his speaking, you know. So I'm with a friend of mine uh, just, a, just a couple months ago in Northern California. And he's a pastor of a church. He gets up to introduce me and he goes, Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you're here this morning and we're going to worship Jesus this morning. So come in and take your places. And let, he's just doing like Jack, you know. Jack, hey, why? Why did he act like that? Did he, you think he had a mirror in his house? And he went over to the mirror he's going, Okay, Jack does this like this. You think he was practicing at home? No, you know why he acts like that? Because he spent time with Jack Hayford. He was on staff with him for 10 years. Okay, here's what I'm saying to you. Stop trying to be like Jesus. Start living with Jesus. Because if you'll be with him, you'll be like him. You won't have to even work, work at it. If you will live with Him, you will be like Him. That's the point. Crazy stuff starts happening. I can tell you stories, man. I spent the month of October in Asia, and like crazy stuff is happening. And I'm going, why is this happening? Ah, I know why it's happening. Because I'm going, Jesus, what are you doing? I want to do it with you. Could I, could I be with you? It's not a ride. It's an adventure. You're walking hand in hand, arm in arm, paraclete, side by side. That's what God has called you to. Stop trying to be like Him. Just start being with Him. Alone, together, just with Him. That's all.
Father, thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging us. Open our eyes to see you. Open our eyes to see you, Father. Jesus, what are you doing? Because we want to do it with you. What are you doing? As we go from this place, Father, make crazy stuff happen to these people. Crazy things. Give them the humility, the openness, the courage to engage you when, when you take them into those circumstances. To work with you. Amen. Amen. Would you be willing to just lift your hand? Every morning, go ahead and do it right now just to get in the habit, you know, just to lift your hand and say, Jesus, what are you doing? I want to do it with you. And then do it tomorrow. Do it this afternoon when you get home. Do it tomorrow. Do it Tuesday. Do it next week and next month and next year and see what happens to your life. Pastor Steve know and he'll let me know because uh, I want to hear about it. I love to hear what goes on, the crazy stuff that happens, the, the, um, the interactions you have with other people. And I wish I had more time with you. You know, we could spend a weekend together just talking about this stuff because God has called you to an adventure, a real adventure, not the, not the Disneyland adventure, the real one. The real one. Yeah, that was beautiful. Um, everything you said, man, that really resonated with me. It was, it was beautiful. So, God's want to bless Bob. He's, um, I, I think he's somebody that we can we can build a relationship with over the over the coming years and. Have him come out a whole bunch more and, and, uh, and teach and, and do his thing. But the one thing I appreciate with a guy like Bob is that he loves the presence of God. He pursues the presence of God. He seeks after God, chases after God. And uh, yeah, that, is, that is beautiful. So uh, I want us to take up an offering for him today and, and bless him.
be our last Sunday in this building. We're going to the YMCA in Woodford. We're out of here. It's going to be awesome. If I haven't told you that, I'm sorry for the shock. But, um, yeah. I don't know. So anyway, we'll see you here next week. It'll be great. Amen.